or then and then I'm going to have to turn off the transcription. Stop transcribing. And I guess the next step is to find out if I am audible enough. So are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Yes, please. OK, good. All right. So. At this point, I'm going to have to share my screen. Um, uh, last week we had um, treated um, deductive reasoning. Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, having gone through deductive reasoning, it it puts us in a very good shape to know what inductive reasoning is all about. You know. So, I think the, the most important part of studying these two kinds of reasoning is to be able to tell, you know, in, in seconds, the difference between them. If you are asked, what's the difference between deductive and inductive in three seconds? And then you just mention, you know. So, the important distinction is that in deductive reasoning, the relationship between the premises and conclusion is logical. Just remember the word logical. A logical relationship. That's, that's what characterizes uh, deductive reasoning. Yeah. Everything about deduction is logical. You know, I told you that deduction is a derivation of um, mathematics. You know, so like mathematics, the meaning of the contents do not matter. But for inductive reasoning, the relationship is not logical. Not logical. It is possible to affirm all the premises and deny the conclusion without contradiction. Um, so I think um, from our example last week, we, we saw that 95% of, of men are honest. Peter is a man, so Peter is honest. And we were saying that Peter is honest is not the only conclusion. If you say Peter is not honest, you are still correct because you said 95% of men are honest. You know, Peter could be among the 95% that are honest. He could also be among the 5% that are not honest. So whether you say Peter is, whether your conclusion is Peter is honest or Peter is not honest, you are still correct. You see? So that is why we say that for inductive reasoning, the relationship between the premises and conclusion is not logical. It is not mathematical the way you see in deductive reasoning. So it is possible to affirm all the premises and deny the conclusion without contradiction because the premises are capable of producing more than one conclusion. So in that case, you need to look at the meanings of contents and then use your common sense. So with regard to the last instruction, you need to look at the meanings of contents and then you use common sense. Uh, the, the point is that, you know, having known that the relationship in an inductive argument is not a logical one, the best way to accept the conclusion is to just use your common sense. If you, if you think that what a particular conclusion is, um, uh, is more likely to be correct, then you are free to take it. In our case, if you feel that Peter is honest, is uh, it's a better conclusion. Then you, then you are free to take it. So that's why we say that for inductive reasoning, in the absence of mathematics, you, you just use your common sense. All right. Inductive arguments. So for inductive arguments, the premises provide reason for believing in the likelihood of the conclusion. The premises give you reason to believe in the likelihood of the conclusion. So likelihood but the premises do not guarantee the conclusion so whereas in deductive argument the premises guarantees the conclusion for inductive arguments they don't guarantee the conclusion they just support the likelihood of the conclusion so when you are dealing with inductive arguments you are just dealing with terms like likelihood okay look at the third sentence inductive arguments are probability <laughs> arguments uh inductive arguments are 
probability arguments. Because inductive arguments do not depend on rules, they are harder to evaluate. Because inductive arguments do not depend on rules, they are harder to evaluate. So, because inductive arguments do not have the mathematical certainty, it is harder to use them. You, you know, it is easier to use something that is accurate. And it is more difficult to use something that is not, is not accurate. That's the point. And they are harder to evaluate. It will take more time for you to decide a conclusion for yourself because a conclusion is not decided. So my own personal definition is that inductive arguments are arguments that are saddled with more than one possible conclusion because the premises support but do not guarantee the stated conclusion. You see? So it's like a man who married more than one wife. A polygamist. Inductive arguments are like polygamists. They don't have just one wife. They, they have several wives. And so it becomes difficult to know which of the wives, uh, you know, should uh, represent them on a particular occasion. And that's what it looks like. Now, we want to go into the technicality of inductive arguments. And in order to do that, we need to clarify certain concepts or certain terms. First of all, you have the difference between verifiable and confirmable statements. Verifiable and confirmable statements. Verifiable statements are statements we can directly test or verify. Usually they are factual or empirical statements. Example, Kofi lost strength with age. Kofi lost strength with age. It's a verifiable statement. If you say Kofi lost strength with age and you want to uh, find out, you want to verify that, then you can uh, look at Kofi, uh, um, you know, get a measurement of his strength. And then if, if there were statistics about his strength about 10 years ago, you get that as well. And then you compare. And if you notice that his strength has reduced, then you have verified the statement. So Kofi lost strength with age is a verifiable statement. You know. On the other hand, we have confirmable statements, statements that we cannot test or verify directly, except through verifiable statements. So we cannot you know, test or verify confirmable statements. We can only use verifiable statements to analyze confirmable statements. Example, all men lose strength with age. When you say all men lose strength with age, you, you can't verify that because you, you don't have access to all men. No, no man can ever have access to all men because there are too many men that have not been born yet. You, know, you needed to account for all the bets that are ahead or in the future in order to do that. I know, only God uh, you know, can do such a thing. So all men lose strength with age it's a confirmable statement. It's not a verifiable statement. Um, but what we'll say is that verifiable statements can help us to analyze or to confirm confirmable statements. So, for, insta for instance, you can combine them and see. Uh, you have premises that are verifiable statements, and then you have a conclusion that is a confirmable statement. So, for premises, you have Kofi lost strength with age, Peter lost strength with age, Michael lost strength with age. So for premises, you have Kofi lost strength with age, Peter, Michael, James lost strength with age, you know. And then for conclusion, you say therefore all men lose strength with age. So what you see here are premises, are verifiable statements, conclusion that are confirmable statements. The premises are helping you to decide whether you want to accept the confirmable statements, you know. On the basis of the premises, you are asking yourself, you are telling yourself that, you know, that the confirmable statements could be true, even though it is not guaranteed, you know. But it has a, a, a high likelihood of being true. You know, if you are confronted with so many statements of men losing with age, losing their strength with age, and you don't even find a single statement of a man who 
has not lost its strength with age, then you begin to uh, tend to accept the conclusion that all men lose strength with age. You know, of course, pending when you might get a contrary report about an old man who retained all his strength. You know, so that's why we say that um, uh, confirmable statements. Uh, cannot be verified, but you can use verifiable statements to um, uh, support or confirm confirmable statements. That, that's why we call them confirmable statements. They stand to be confirmed. So the premises are verifiable statements leading to the conclusion which is unverifiable or confirmable statements. <clears throat> Another example, Mary reached menopause by 40. Grace reached menopause by 35. Meredith reached menopause by 33. Rose reached menopause by 34. Edith reached menopause by 38. So far, reached menopause by 45. Therefore, half of all women will reach menopause by 35. <clears throat> now, if you look at the premises, you see that um, half of the women reach their menopause on or before 35, and then the other half after 35 and uh, so because of that you know if you say uh three premises are about reaching menopause before 35 and then three premises are about reaching menopause after 35 therefore half of all women will reach menopause by 35 so that sounds like um a reasonable conclusion based on the analysis of the premises you know so that's how it works verifiable statements serving to confirm confirmable statements. Now, the important question is, how do you detect confirmable statements? How do you detect confirmable statements? There are two ways of detecting confirmable statements. First of all, they are not directly testable or verifiable. All you need to do to confirm that this is a confirmable statement is to ask yourself, is this statement verifiable? If the answer is no, this statement is not verifiable, then automatically it's a confirmable statement. And then the second one is that confirmable statements can be converted into conditional statements. Example, let's look at this categorical statement. No leader steps down from power unless compelled by a coup or constitution. No leader steps down from power unless compelled by a coup of con constitution. Of course, you can see it's a confirmable statement because it can't even be verified. So what we're saying is that another way of knowing that this is a confirmable statement is that you can convert it into a conditional statement. So the conditional translation would be, if X is a leader, then X would not step down unless compelled by a coup or constitution. You know, when, when you look at, uh, to convert to, uh, to conditional statement, of course, I, I uh, mentioned how we can convert statements, categorical statements to conditional statements in our last class. So if you look at it, you see that uh, no leader steps down. So if X is a leader, that's what it's saying. Then X will not step down, you know. Okay, and then to help, it is impossible to convert directly testable statements. So it is impossible to convert verifiable statements into conditional statements. A statement that is directly verifiable or testable cannot be converted into a conditional statement or version. Example, okay, just get any verifiable statement. Kofi lost strength with age. Can you convert it to a, a conditional statement? Would you say if a man is called Kofi, then such a man lost strength with age? How does that look like? That would mean that all men called Kofi have lost strength with age, and there are no strong young men called Kofi. You know. So you can't say if a man is called Kofi, then such a man lost strength with age. I mean, if you see a small boy, a, a, a three-year-old boy called Kofi, will you say he has lost strength with age? He is he's a kid, he's not yet old. You know, so that shows you that you can't even convert verifiable statements into conditional statements. It's only confirmable statements that you can com uh, convert to conditional statements. And that also tells you, when you are dealing with deductive arguments, 
we were saying that uh, when we were analyzing deductive arguments, there, there's something we call a major premise. And in our last class, we were saying that a, it is only a major premise that you can convert into a conditional statement. You can remember that. You know, if you like, you can go and watch the video again. We were saying in our last class that it's only a major premise that you can convert into a conditional statement. And, you know, and then the first part of the conditional statement is called the antecedent. The second one is called the consequent. So that was what we were saying in our last class. If you look at that major premise in the deductive argument, you see that that major premise is a confirmable statement. It is only the other premise that is a verifiable statement. So if you like, you can go back to that class and see it, you know. So even when you are dealing with deductive arguments, one premise is a confirmable statement. The other premise is a verifiable statement. When you say all men are mortal, that's confirmable. Kofi is a man, that is verifiable, you know. So it is the all men are mortal that you can convert to a conditional statement. And that is where you place your antecedent and consequence. And then from there, you do the rest of your analysis. Okay. So that's that about uh, verifiable and confirmable statements. The other thing we need to know, we need to appreciate before we, uh, you know, continue with the inductive class, is the distinction between the finite and infinite reference classes, which we did in our last class when we we're introducing uh, uh, deductive arguments. You know, we're saying that the finite reference class is a class of countable items. Example: this copper, that man, some boys, that table, and so on. And then the infinite reference class is a class of uncountable items. Example, all metals, all men, all voters, no metal, no man, no voter, you know. So we need to remember this as we are going to analyze inductive arguments. And then the, the third distinction we need to uh, get comfortable with is the distinction between law-like and statistical hypothesis. Law-like and statistical hypothesis. Law-like hypothesis are confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. That's the infinite reference class. We're talking about confirmable statements with the infinite reference class. You know, example, all metals expand when heated. That's a confirmable statement with an infinite reference class. A confirmable statement that is a universal statement. You know. So if you convert it to a conditional, all metals expand when heated. If X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. Another example, all Fs are Gs. Each F is a G. No Fs are Gs. So all Fs are not Gs. So law-like hypotheses are confirmable statements that refer to all members or no members of a class. So that's law-like. What makes it law-like is that it, it is either referring to all or it is referring to none. There's no midway. If there's anything it is saying, it is saying it about all items. It is not saying it about some or a few. It is saying it about all or it is denying it of all. That's why it is law-like. So that any item at all in that reference class, you know, uh, enjoys or suffers the, from, the, from the, the analysis. That's why we call it law-like. A law-like hypothesis, a confirmable statement that refers to all or no members of the class. On the other hand, uh, okay, uh, so before we go to statistical hypothesis, law-like are highly predictive. Law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. Now, one of the reasons why we call it law-like is, is that it makes it highly predictable. Uh, if, it, it, if it refers to all members of a class, then it means that any member of a class is very predictably you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, applicable to what is being said about all the items. For instance, G must be attributed or not attributed to every F. All men are mortal. If Peter is a man, then Peter is mortal. Anything that is a man is very predictably mortal because you said all men are mortal. 
So law-like hypotheses are highly predictive, which is quite obvious. But statistical hypotheses, are, uh, which are confirmable statements referring to some percentage, less than 100% and more than 0%. For example, 90% of those who uh, ate, ate the food fell sick. And you, we have other statistical, uh, statistical terms who have some, few, many. You can say some of those who ate the food first sick or many of those who ate the food first sick, you know. Or you can say uh, most of those who ate the food first sick or hardly any of those who ate the food first sick. Or you can even say those who ate the food typically fell sick. So there are statistical terms. And statistical hypotheses are less predictive, less predictive. If X is a food, X is likely to fall sick. Well, you're not sure X will fall sick. If it is a law-like hypothesis, you say all those who ate the food fell sick. So if X ate the food, then X surely fell sick, surely. Uh, but in this case, you say it is not all who fell sick. 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. If X ate the food, then, well, X is likely to have fallen sick. So statistical hypotheses are less predictive compared to law-like hypotheses. Then we have confirmation versus proof. And this is where we find uh, the crux of the matter between inductive and deductive arguments. Inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. They, they try to confirm the conclusion, but as you have seen, they can't prove the conclusion. They can't guarantee the conclusion. The conclusion. Deductive arguments are aimed at proof, you know. And now confirmation is not proof, you know. Evidence confirms but does not prove the truth of the hypothesis. Now, this thing about evidence, we are going to see it uh, as we move on. But what we are saying is that confirmable statements aim to confirm, or rather, inductive arguments aim to confirm their conclusions. But deductive arguments aim to prove their conclusions, uh, uh, you know. And what inductive arguments do, confirmation, is not as strong as what deductive arguments do, which is proof, you know. Okay. And then evidence confirms what does not prove the truth of a hypothesis. So evidence can confirm something, but doesn't prove it. Let, let us see the limitation of evidence. Uh, but we're going to see it very soon. Now, two major ways to detect inductive arguments. So this is a prime question. How do you detect, detect inductive arguments? We need to answer that question before we move on. Number one, it is capable of more than one conclusion. When you see an argument is capable of more than one conclusion, then that's how to know it's an inductive argument. 90% of those who ate the food fell sick, Amma ate the food, Amma fell sick, or Amma did not fall sick. The two conclusions are correct, but they are opposites. Because um, Amma could be among the 90% who fell sick, or she could be among the 90% who ate the food but didn't fell sick. Okay. Now, the second way of detecting inductive arguments is that inductive arguments are extrapolations. An extrapolation is an activity that smuggles in information into the conclusion that is absent in any of the premises. An, extra, an extrapolation is an activity that smuggles information into the conclusion that is absent in any of the premises. All inductive conclusions contain information that is not accounted in the premises. Let's see how it is. Uh, this is the technicality. Now, a known thing, A, you know, and basically this is how induction works. A known thing, A, has certain properties such as X, Y, and Z. Another thing, B, that is not in the premises, has the same properties X, Y, and Z. So both A and B have X, Y, and Z. Now, A also has an additional property, Q. Q. And then you say that on the basis of the above three premises, the argument concludes, or in reality extrapolates, that B also has the additional property Q. So the idea of induction is that if B is like A in some respects, then B may also be like A in some other respects. That's what inductive argument does. 
and and that's why inductive arguments don't guarantee their conclusions. They 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 they, they are just like guesswork. You say A has three properties, B has the same three properties like A, and then tomorrow when you see that A has a fresh property or another property, then you begin to conclude because of your past analysis that A and B has three properties. You say, oh, if A also has this one, then B could also have it. That's an inductive argument. But you don't have a guarantee that that is true. Now, that fresh property that you are saying that B has because A has it, that property is smuggled into the conclusion without being in any of the premises because that property was not there. You know, It is only three properties that are in the premises and then a fresh property comes in. But let's see how it works. Uh, we'll, we'll get to it. Directions of extrapolation. Now, extrapolation, you can extrapolate in different directions. First of all, you have part whole extrapolations, attributing something to a whole that constitutes a part or parts. You know. Now, we have two kinds of um, part whole extrapolations. You have generalizations, and then you have statistical syllogisms. Now, for generalization, you have Peter is strong, James is strong, therefore all men are strong. That's a generalization. You know, you conclude that all men are strong on the basis of two premises, that two men are strong. That's a generalization. And then you have statistical syllogisms. Most, or maybe 90% of Canadian uh, university students drink alcohol. Caroline is a university student, therefore Caroline drinks alcohol. So that's a statistical syllogism. And that's the, uh, the example we've been using of inductive arguments. In. So that's also uh, a part whole extrapolation, extrapolating from a whole to a part. The other one is extrapolating from a part to a whole. Then we have analogies, arguing that something possesses the same thing as another because they both possess some other properties. Example, the structural adjustment program was good for Cameroon, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Uganda, which is a third world country. And then the structural adjustment program was good for Senegal, which is a third world country. And then the structural adjustment program was good for Nigeria, which is a third world country. Therefore, the structural adjustment program must be good for Togo, which is a third world country. Now, having analyzed that the structural adjustment program was good for about four or five third world countries, the conclusion is that it must be good for another third world country. You know, so that's an analogy. You are making an analogy from one country to another country because the two countries are third world countries. So the, the analogy between the two countries is that they are third world countries and what applies here might also apply there. So that's an analogy. It's a type of inductive argument or a type of extrapolation. Then you have predictions, predictions. Attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of frequency of past occurrences of the same quality in similar events. Attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of frequency of past occurrences of the same quality in similar events. Example, Tyson has won his last 30 boxing fights. That's a premise. Tyson has won his last 30 boxing fights. Conclusion, Tyson will win his next boxing fight. You know, so attributing something to Tyson in future because it has been applied to Tyson in the past, that's a prediction. So that it's also a type of inductive argument, a type of extrapolation. But you can see that there's no guarantee. Because someone could have made this prediction before Tyson's first loss. And then Tyson went ahead to lose the fight. See, so It's never, never really guaranteed. Okay. So now when you look at predictions, you look at analogies, you look at statistical syllogisms, you look at generalizations. Ask yourself, what is in the conclusion that is not in any of the premises? Let's begin with uh, generalization. 
Peter is strong, James is strong, therefore all men are strong. There is something in the conclusion that is absent in the premises. What could it be? Anyone with any idea? What information is in the conclusion that is absent in each of the premises? So you see that the, conclu the, the conclusion contains the information, all men. But the premises are talking about particular men. And remember that all men is an infinite reverence class. And Peter is a particular, is a finite reference class. James is a finite reference class. So the premises all have finite reference classes. Then the conclusion is an infinite reference class. So you are concluding uh, premises of finite reference class with a conclusion of infinite reference class. So the infinite reference class is strange to the argument. It is not accounted in the premises. There doesn't seem to be a basis for the infinite reference class, all men, in the conclusion. So you can say that it was smuggled into the conclusion without being accounted in any of the premises. Then look at uh, statistical syllogisms. Most Canadian university students drink alcohol. Can Caroline is a Canadian university student, so Caroline drinks alcohol. Now what is in the conclusion that is not in the premises? Caroline drinks alcohol. If you look at it, you see that uh, the, the, the Caroline drinks alcohol is, is an information that refers to all members, all Canadian university students. Because for you to say Caroline drinks alcohol, you must have established that if anyone is a Canadian university student, that person drinks alcohol. But that was not established. So what was not established in the premises was smuggled into the conclusion. And look at analogies. Look at the analogies. You have um, about four or five uh, third world countries, you know, doing well with a structural adjustment program. And then the conclusion is that another country, which is a third world country, will do well. You know, what is in that conclusion that is not in any of the premises? The information that was smuggled into the conclusion is that Togo will do well. Because Togo doing well is not mentioned in any of the premises. The premises do not establish that Togo is doing well. So for the conclusion to say that Togo must do well is, uh, is a bit unsupported. It is not guaranteed. So you can say that at best, the conclusion is uh, a guess, or you can say the, co the conclusion is guesswork. And look at predictions. Tyson has won his last 30 boxing, boxing fights. Therefore, Tyson will win his next boxing fight. Now, his last 30 boxing fights are events in the past, but the conclusion contains information about the future. Meanwhile, the premise does not account for the future. So the future was smuggled into the conclusion without being accounted in the premises. So we can say that uh, the role of the future in the conclusion is uh, a, a, a little bit tricky. It is like uh, an unwelcome visitor. He doesn't really know what it is doing there. And anyone who raises objection against that visitor can, can easily chase him out.
Okay, so that's why we say that um, when you look at inductive arguments carefully, you must find an information that has been smuggled into the conclusion without being accounted for by the premises, either individually as premises or collectively as premises. Now, there are two kinds of enumerative inductive arguments based on the strength of an inductive argument. An enumerative argument means an argument with many premises, you know, enumerating the premises like a list. The first of kind of argument is the ones with uh, law-like hypothesis as conclusion. Example, you look at this conclusion, it is a law-like hypothesis as conclusion. All metals expand when heated. That's a law-like hypothesis. So it is serving as a conclusion in this argument. So this is an argument that uses a law-like hypothesis as conclusions. If the conclusion were 90% of metals expand when heated, then that will be a statistical hypothesis serving as conclusion. Now let's deal with this example. Gold expanded when heated. Silver expanded when heated. Bronze expanded when heated. Copper expanded when heated. Aluminium, platinum, brass, lead, uh, lead, iron, zinc, all of them, each of them expanded when heated. So you have 10 premises, about 10 metals that expanded when heated. And then you even have a summary premise, a summary premise summarizing that all 10 metals that have been tested so far expanded when heated. Then you have the conclusion that says all metals, all, expand when heated. Now, if you look at it very well, you see that uh, there's a difference. Or rather, there's some, some sort of uh, disagreement between the conclusion and all the premises. Now, if you check premises 1 to 10, they are all particular statements. All of them are particular statements. And even the summary premise is a particular statement. All the metals tested, the 10 metals tested, expanded so far, is a particular statement. Then the conclusion just goes ahead with uh, a general statement. All metals expand when heated. So first of all, the premises have not tested all metals. If at all, it is possible to test all metals because there are some metals that are in the ground that are yet to be discovered. So it's probably not possible to test all metals. But then the conclusion says all metals expand when heated. So there is a jump, an unexplained jump from particular statements to a general conclusion. So that's one big problem with um, inductive arguments with law-like hypothesis as conclusions. They are usually, the conclusions are usually quite difficult to establish. So premises 1 to 10 are verifiable and particular statements. The summary premise is a summation of all the verifiable premises, but the conclusion is a confirmable and a general statement. So the argument is strictly invalid because it involves jumping from verifiable to confirmable statements. And that's the reason why confirmation is not proof and inductive arguments are not valid. In fact, the conclusion is false because there are some, some metals, in fact, do not expand when heated. They are called superconductors. Such metals do not absorb heat, therefore they, do, they don't expand. So the conclusion is, in fact, false and all the premises are true. And that's why we say that it is possible to deny the conclusion with all true premises or affirm premises and deny conclusion without contradiction. And that's applicable to all the types of extrapolation, part whole, analogies, predictions. So that's the nitty gritty of uh, inductive arguments. Now, there are certain qualities that inductive arguments have 
which deductive arguments do not have. And there are certain qualities that um, deductive arguments have. So there are certain qualities that uh, deductive arguments have, which inductive arguments do not have. Let me see, someone's microphone is on. Matilda, Matilda Faith, can you put off your microphone? Okay, that's fine. So now, um, let's take a look at differences, different qualities of deductive and inductive. There are certain qualities that inductive arguments have, which uh, deductive don't have. There are certain qualities deductive have, inductives don't have. You know, there are, there are, and then the advantage of deductive argument is the disadvantage of inductive argument. And then the advantage of inductive argument is the disadvantage of deductive argument. So let's look at, let's begin with accuracy versus providing information. Deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the inability to provide information. Examples, either it is raining or it is not raining, which is a disjunctive syllogism. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. That's a conditional statement. Now, if you look at the two of them, they are accurate. They are always accurate. There is no situation where they will not be accurate. Either it is raining or it is not raining. It's an accurate statement. Right now, it is not raining in my place where I am. So it is accurate. Even if it were raining, it would be accurate. Because you said either it is raining or it is not raining. So that statement will continue to be accurate. But does it provide you information about whether it is raining? The answer is no. So it is accurate at the expense of providing you with real world information. And then number two, if it is raining, then someone will get wet. It, that, that's always correct. If it rains, someone will get wet because someone will be caught off guard. There will always be people outside when it's raining. Not everyone would run for cover before the drops uh, begin to come down. So statement number two is always correct and will never be incorrect. But, but does it tell you whether it is raining? It doesn't. So it is accurate at the expense of providing you with information about the real world. So that's one of the problems of deductive arguments. They are accurate at the expense of providing information. Information at the expense of accuracy. Inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. So for, for you to provide any statement that provides information is a falsifiable statement. Once a statement provides information about the real world, then that statement, we say that statement is falsifiable because the information is capable of being falsified. The, the, the statement is capable of being true or false. You know. Example, it is raining right now. That's a falsifiable statement because it is providing information about raining. It is saying that it is raining right now. That's a real world information or an information about the real world. And then if I check, it is not raining where I am. And so it is false. So it is falsifiable. Now, providing information comes at the expense of accuracy. Once a statement provides information about the real world, then that statement has done so at the expense of accuracy. So if you go for accuracy, 
you are unable to provide information. If you go for information, you are unable to guarantee accuracy. If you take one, you have to uh, let go of the other one. So deductive arguments provide information at the expense of, uh, dedu deductive arguments uh, are accurate at the expense of providing information. But inductive arguments, inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. And the information that inductive arguments normally provide are the ones that were smuggled into their conclusions without being accounted for in any of the premises. <coughs> Because it is not accounted in any of the promises, the information is not guaranteed. But it is information nonetheless. Falsifiability and science. Any valuable empirical information must be falsifiable. Any valuable imp imp empirical information must be falsifiable. Any statement that is not falsifiable cannot be a verifiable or confirmable statement. Any statement that is not falsifiable cannot be a verifiable or confirmable statement. Any statement that is absolutely true has no empirical content. A statement cannot be absolutely true and it has empirical content. <clears throat> okay. So the more valuable the information, the more falsifiable it is. The more valuable the information, the more falsifiable. The empirical statement, it rains every third Friday of the month. It's more valuable information than it rained just now. Now, compare these two empirical statements. It rained just now, and it rains every third Friday of the month. Which information is more valuable? It rained just now is valuable, yes. We can use that information to do something. But it is more valuable to know that it rains every third Friday of the month. You can you can do a lot of things with that. If you know that it rains every third Friday of the month, then you arrange all your activities to so, so that the rain will not affect you every third Friday of the month. So that means that you can achieve more with that statement than you will achieve with the statement it rained just now. So the statement, it rained every third Friday of the month, is more valuable information, empirical information, compared to the statement it rained just now. But we're saying that the more valuable, the more falsifiable. So the more valuable the empirical information, the more falsifiable it is. Just, it, just only one third Friday of the month, it will take only one third Friday of, of, of the month of not raining to falsify that statement. So if there's any uh, third Friday that it doesn't rain, then the statement has been falsified. And then the second type of inductive argument, arguments with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. Example, premise one. Uh, before we talk about the premises, look at the conclusion, and then you can see that it's a statistical hypothesis. Polio vaccination has 80% potential of preventing polio, 80%. So that's a, stat a statistical hypothesis. Okay, so let's look at the premises. Premise one, Michael was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Then two, Gilbert was vaccinated for polio and suffered polio. Mary was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Stanley was vaccinated for polio and never suffered it. James was vaccinated for polio and never suffered it. Bob was vaccinated and suffered it. Jill was vaccinated and never suffered it. Samuel was vaccinated and never suffered it. John was vaccinated and never suffered. Carol was vaccinated and never suffered. So the, 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 the summary premise is that eight out of 10 people who were vaccinated for polio did not suffer polio. So two persons suffered, eight did not suffer. So the conclusion is that polio vaccination has 80% potential of preventing polio. So this is an argument with a statistical hypothesis as conclusion. And you can see that this is uh, a better argument, or it is a more modest argument, or let's say it is a more prudent argument compared to arguments with um, 
law-like hypothesis as conclusion. If you say that 10 metals is not an expand, and then on the basis of that, you say that all metals do not expand when heated. Uh, you wouldn't be proud of that argument because you know you can't, you can't always defend it. But this one, you have 10 people vaccinated for polio and eight of them never suffered it again. And then your conclusion is that uh, polio vaccination has 80% chances of success. You can see that you'll be, you'll be more proud of this argument compared to uh, the argument with a law-like hypothesis as conclusion. So the statistical arguments or the, the arguments with statistical hypothesis as conclusion are more modest and um, very often wiser compared to uh, the ones with law-like hypothesis as conclusions. Yeah. Because once you don't have the information about the behavior of all the items in a class, in a reference class, then it is difficult to make a conclusion that says something about all the items in a reference class. So that's the two types of inductive arguments, the ones ending with law-like hypothesis as conclusions and the ones ending with statistical hypothesis as conclusions. So hypotheses are technically regarded as conclusions of inductive arguments. So when you look at it, the conclusion of any inductive arguments, it is, uh, it is usually a hypothesis. It is very often a hypothesis because they are confirmable statements to be supported or confirmed or denied by um, verifiable statements. So that's the end of the class. Uh, tomorrow we'll be looking at causal reasoning. Causal reasoning is a type of um, inductive argument. Uh, causal reasoning is a type of inductive argument that argues from causes to effects. What caused what? You know, what is the effect of what? You know. So that's tomorrow by 2 p.m. But right now, uh, let's see if um, there are any questions to be asked. Uh, if you, any of you have questions, he or she can <clears throat> raise up his or her hand, ask it, and then we'll tackle it and then end the class so that I will upload the recorded session to or the video to your platforms for you to watch. So any questions so far? Sir, so, yeah, go ahead. What's the main difference between the deductive and the inductive argument? What's the clear difference? Yeah, we're saying that uh, the deductive permits only one conclusion, but inductive arguments generate more than one possible conclusion. Okay, so we say the inductive has many conclusions as compared to the deductive. Uh, no, you don't say it has many conclusions. You say that it generates more than one possible conclusion. More than one possible conclusion. Okay. Okay. And Thank then, you. and then, and then, the, no, there are two differences. That's the, the second one is that uh, the relationship uh, for for deductive arguments, the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical. It's a logical relationship. But for inductive argument, the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not logical. Okay. Okay. Yes, and I think that uh, as far as the course is concerned, it is the second one that we're going to provide. Because when you look at the, the, the textbook, when you look at the textbook that you have that has been given to you for the course, the, 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 the main difference is the logical nature of uh, the, 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 the premises and the conclusions in both arguments. The textbook tells you that uh, the relationship between premises and conclusion is logical for deductive argument, but it is not logical for inductive argument. So that's that's the one you are going to give back to them if they are assessing you, because that is the one in the textbook. But this other one is the one I'm, I'm bringing to the course because it makes it very clear to you how to distinguish both. So you can, you can provide both of them if you have the opportunity. Okay, sir. Thank you. All right.
Okay, so um, let me see. Someone's hands are raised. Is raised. Uh, Carlos, Carlos, do you have a question? Yes, sir, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Okay, sir, a little clarification, please. Mm. Must the um, must the hypothesis of any enumerative induction be law-like or statistical? Uh, yeah, those are the two categories. Unless you can identify any other category apart from the two, but it's either uh, law-like or, or statistical. Okay. So that's the two categories. Some the inductive arguments can actually end with, um, uh, what do you call it? Some inductive arguments can actually end with a verifiable statement as conclusion, you know. But uh, but, but that's um, the, 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 that's outside the two categories. The two categories are uh, categories of confirmable statements when they are conclusions. But it doesn't mean that the confirmable statements are always the conclusions of uh, inductive arguments. Sometimes a verifiable statement could be a conclusion. Like Caroline, Caroline drinks alcohol is a verifiable statement. You know. But we're saying that when a confirmable statement is a conclusion, it is either law-like or statistical. And the, the reason for distinguishing it like that is to know how to handle it. Okay, so um, now I'm going to end the class uh, so that I um, upload the video to your platforms for those who didn't make it. Okay, last question. Okay, go ahead. Is it um, tangible to say that deductive or deductive reasonings or arguments are well defined, whilst in terms of their conclusions and premises, whilst uh, the inductive ones are essentially contestable. Yeah, the inductive arguments are essentially contestable because they give you more than one possible conclusion. So you can say they are essentially contestable. Oh, OK, OK. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, so uh, only 40 people, is it 40? Yeah, only 40 people attended this class. So that tells me that majority didn't come to this class. So I'm, I'm quickly going to upload it to the platform for all those who didn't attend the class, and that's a very large number, to begin to watch. Uh, it's quite unfortunate that we couldn't hold this class on Good Friday because the university authorities insisted uh, that uh, we just go on our holidays. You know? So that's fine. Tomorrow we'll be doing causal reasoning, and I hope we'll uh, regain our normal population. So until tomorrow, I wish all of you the best. Just have a good night, uh, or rather have a good day, sleep well, and then come around tomorrow for tomorrow's uh, lecture. So at this point, Thank I'm going say. to, all right, so I'm going to stop the recording.